Welcome back to the Hardware Unboxed News Corner for what will be the final part of our CES News Roundup coverage. The show, well, it seems to have been pretty busy as it always is. Both Steve and I are very glad we didn't venture over to Las Vegas to deal with, you know, the noisy show floor, massive crowds, packed schedules, that sort of thing. Seems like covering this sort of event from home is certainly the way to go. Also, before we get into the news topics, just want to say thanks to you guys for all the support we've received over the last couple of weeks. Firstly, in relation to the AMD CES coverage and the whole lead up to that, uh, you might have seen we received quite a lot of negative feedback on our various rumors about what AMD would do at CES. Most of that, I think, was from unreasonable fanboys, but it certainly was quite nice to hear support from the vast majority of our regular audience, which are, I guess, more reasonable people. And secondly, for the overwhelming feedback we received on our RTX 2060 video a few days ago, where we described how NVIDIA has basically screwed us over on that one, it's really touching to hear how many of you appreciate our coverage on these launches and products. We're still hoping to work through that one with NVIDIA. Obviously, it's a busy time right now with CES going on, but I think the community getting behind us is helping get the message through to the right people. So yeah, hopefully there'll be some progress on that soon. Moving on to the actual news topics, NVIDIA CEO Jensen Huang made some pretty unusual, I guess you'd have to say, comments to PC World in relation to both AMD's upcoming Radeon 7 graphics card and FreeSync monitors. When speaking about the Radeon 7, Huang said it's underwhelming before going on to elaborate that the performance is lousy and there's nothing new. There's no ray tracing no AI, it's 7 nanometers with HBM memory that barely keeps up with A2080. And if we turn on DLSS, we'll crush it. And if we turn on ray tracing, we'll crush it. He also said, it's a weird launch. Maybe they thought of it this morning. Now, it's not unusual for Jensen to come out and make these sorts of statements about a competitor's products, but these ones are pretty funny in my opinion, mostly because there's really no way NVIDIA would actually know that the card barely keeps up with the 2080 because it hasn't really been released. They also wouldn't know if performance is lousy. Of course, He's right that the Radeon 7 doesn't support ray tracing, but it seems most people don't actually care about that anyway. So it's mostly just a load of crap out of NVIDIA CEO's mouth. Uh, Jensen also spoke a bunch of crap about FreeSync monitors, claiming FreeSync was never proven to work, that NVIDIA invented the area of adaptive sync, and that they do not even work with AMD's graphics cards. Now, I can't say I've tested every single adaptive sync monitor on the market, but I've certainly tested a fair few at this point, and Every single one has, in fact, worked. The issues NVIDIA showed off in their keynote are completely ridiculous in my opinion. I would certainly immediately RMA a monitor if I ever saw those problems, especially things like flickering, and they're certainly not indicative of the wider adaptive sync monitor ecosystem. So to say that most FreeSync monitors don't work is a load of fecal matter, and I'd say a claim like that is bordering on a complete lie, so I hope people aren't actually taking those statements seriously. The other GPU news to emerge in the last few days comes from AMD CTO Mark Papermaster in an interview with The Street. Here, Papermaster says that the company is really excited to start on the high end with our 7 nanometer Radeon 7, but crucially, he goes on to say, and you will see the announcements over the course of the year as we refresh across our Radeon program. This indicates that AMD will indeed release more Radeon products in 2019. They're not just gonna release the Radeon 7 and call it a day. I guess this isn't overly surprising news. We're still expecting Navi to launch at some point, likely towards the back half of the year, but it's nice to get an actual statement from an AMD executive that reiterates more GPUs are to come later down the line. Intel has quietly pushed out more ninth generation processors. Anantec spotted some new entries into Intel's and Dell Australia's databases that go beyond the simple six new products we talked about in News Corner a few days ago. None of these products are super interesting, but we'll go over them anyway. We have the Core i7-9700. It's basically a locked version of the 9700K at a 65 watt TDP and with the slightly lower maximum frequency of 4.7 gigahertz, still on eight cores without hyper-threading. Then we have the Core i3 9100, a four core, four thread CPU at up to 4.2 gigahertz, again locked at 65 watts. Then there's the Pentium G5420, a two core, four thread CPU at 3.8 gigahertz. Even more strange is the Core i3-8100F spotted in Intel's database. It's a Core i3-8100 without an iGPU, of course, but it's interesting that they've quietly pushed out an F model of this CPU with 8th generation branding, as opposed to integrating it into their 9th gen lineup. Not a whole lot of other details on these processes, but it seems Intel are intent on fleshing out the 9th gen series with everything from low-end Pentium parts right up to the 9900K. 
Hard OCP has found a number of AMD Radeon 7 benchmark numbers buried in the footnotes of AMD's press release and kindly tabulated them for everyone to see. AMD tested both the Radeon 7 and Vega 64 on an Intel Core i7 7700K test rig with 16 gigabytes of DDR4 3000 memory, running AMD driver 18.50 and Windows 10 with every game tested at 4K using maximum settings. On average, you can see the Radeon 7 is around 29% faster across 25 games, but naturally there's a bit of a spread here. Games like Forza Horizon 4, Hitman 2, and Monster Hunter World see smaller gains, with Hitman 2 delivering a surprisingly low 7% uplift in AMD's testing. Then there are outliers on the opposite end of the scale, like Fallout 76's 68% uplift and Strange Brigade's 42%. Interestingly, AMD used Strange Brigade to show the Radeon 7 outperform the RTX 2080 by a healthy margin. The other games AMD showed Battlefield 5 and Far Cry 5 deliver more modest 33 and 26% gains respectively over Vega 64. Most titles are around that mark as well. Of course it's always worth taking performance numbers from a manufacturer with a grain of salt. We strongly encourage you wait for independent reviews to verify how the Radeon 7 performs before you go out and buy one. Some interesting power supplies have been spotted by Anantec at CES from one of the larger ODMs, FSP. While not a known brand that sells directly to consumers, FSP manufacture a lot of power supplies for these known brands. At CES, they've been demonstrating their line of twin redundant power supplies. So these are basically a standard ATX PSU form factor, but inside are two separate power supplies, which are automatically switched between in the case one fails. They're also hot swappable, so you can replace a failed unit without powering down the system, handy for some niche use cases. The company already has 500 watt and 700 watt units and is working on a bigger 900 watt unit for higher end systems. FSP also showed off a liquid cooled power supply, which just baffles me as to why anyone would want or need that sort of product. They have a $700, 1200 watt unit and a $400, 850 watt unit that will be available near the end of Q1, both of which still have fans in the event the liquid Liquid loop fails. When the loop is working, the power ratings increase for each power supply up to 1400 watts and 1000 watts respectively. They also say these units should be installed in the top of the system just in case, again, the loop fails. Having a liquid cool PSU just seems like a disaster waiting to happen. If something goes wrong and liquid drips onto the active components, it could cause a short circuit and blow stuff up. So it really seems like the last component you'd actually want to liquid cool, and it's not all that necessary, but whatever FSP has some new units for those that do want something like this. We love our benchmarks here at Hardware Box, so it's good to hear there's another one ready for our consumption in the form of 3D Mark's first ray tracing benchmark, Port Royal. We tend not to use 3D Mark for our GPU benchmark videos because we like to stick to real world games, but for those that do want to test out the ray tracing ability of their GPU, especially their RTX GPU, you can now download Port Royal and give it a try. KitGuru tested out the new benchmark and got these results across the RTX 2060 to RTX 2080 Ti. Unsurprisingly, the RTX 2080 Ti has a bit more than double the ray tracing performance, which makes sense because NVIDIA rates the 2080 Ti is capable of 10 giga rays per second, compared to just 5 giga rays per second for the RTX 2060. Toshiba has launched the first hard drive with a 16 terabyte capacity called the MG08 series. It's a 3.5 inch helium filled drive consisting of nine 1.7 terabyte platters. Toshiba continues to be the only company using nine platter designs in 3.5 inch drives. It also uses two-dimensional magnetic recording, or TDMR, with thinner platters and TDK developed heads. Unfortunately, there's no performance numbers just yet, but the drives are rated for a 550 terabyte annualized workload and had a 2.5 million hour MTBF. The drives also come with a five-year warranty. There's no firm word on price or release date just yet, mostly because Toshiba says it will take about four to six months to validate these drives with their partners. All right, time for another wave of monitor news. First up, we have some new monitors from Lenovo. We have the Y27GQ, which is the first 27-inch 1440p 240Hz monitor to hit the market using a new panel from AU Optronics. It's a TN panel, of course, to hit that sort of refresh rate with a response time listed of 0.5 milliseconds. There's also 90% DCI-P3 coverage and G-Sync, and it's expected to hit the market in April for around $1,000. So yep, that's pretty expensive. 
Lenovo also has the Y44W, a 43 inch double wide monitor with a resolution of 3840 by 1200, so basically two 1610 panels side by side. It comes with a 144Hz refresh rate and FreeSync, plus it's rated for display HDR400. It'll hit the market also in April for $1200. Dell has joined in with two monitor announcements at CES. They'll be the first company to release a laptop with a 240Hz 1080p display that will be available in March as a configuration option for their Alienware M15 laptop. The company also has, through their Alienware brand, a 55-inch OLED gaming display, which I guess is more of a TV, but it does sport a 4K resolution at 120Hz plus some seriously decent HDR. No word on pricing or release date just yet, but it does look quite interesting. Final topic for this week, The Division 2 will be available not on Steam, but on the new Epic Games Store. This is a pretty major pickup for the Epic Games Store, which seems to be attracting developers through its much higher cut of revenue for developers compared to Steam. The game was listed on Steam to begin with, and Ubisoft will honour any purchases that have been made through Steam, but since this announcement, the game has been removed in favour of a listing on the Epic Games Store, along with Ubisoft's own Uplay Store. That's it for this week's News Corner. Pretty much just a straight week of news, as you might expect from CES time, but we'll be back with some non-news coverage tomorrow. I think Steve's got something interesting planned. As always, you can subscribe to get what is usually weekly news coverage in your inbox every Friday or thereabouts. Consider supporting us on Patreon so we can continue to buy our own review samples, but mostly so you can join our Discord chat and monthly live streams, and I'll catch you in the next one.